Episode 2, The Paradox. Welcome to The Paradox with your attending, Dr. Eric Larson. He is a practicing anesthesiologist and clinical assistant professor at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. Listen in as he takes you behind the scenes of what practicing medicine in today's ever-changing world is like with another doctor. The Paradox is a fun and accidentally informative show for physicians, patients, or anyone who has ever found themselves in a waiting room. Welcome back to another episode of The Paradox. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Larson. And however you stumbled upon me today, I really appreciate you visiting. I appreciate any time you share this podcast with all your friends and if you're a physician with the other colleagues. It's real important to discuss these issues, which are important not just to physicians, but also to patients and really anyone who's ever, again, found themselves in a waiting room. I want to thank Tim Doctor for that great intro. Uh, He is no relation to me, by the way. I'd encourage you to visit my website at theparadox.com to leave comments, questions, and certainly catch the show notes and links to things that were discussed during this episode. Today's an episode which we're going to discuss direct primary care. Uh, this, is a, this is a practice of medicine which is not very familiar to most people. Most people are used to traditional medicine, and I'll say that in air quotes, I guess, uh, where you have insurance carrier and then you go see the doctor, you have a copay, you have a deductibles, et cetera, et cetera. Some people have Medicare, some people have Medicaid or use government payers. Uh, but direct primary care is a totally different method of delivering health care. It's not only different for the patients and in many ways liberating for them, it is equally liberating for physicians. I've met a number of physicians who have moved to direct primary care, and they're obviously all primary care physicians. But their attitude towards medicine is really unlike any other physicians I run across in my journeys through various specialties and meeting people through the medical society and other places. So I just want you to go with me in this journey with Dr. Amat and find out how she ended up in direct primary care, why she did, the advantages of it, and see what you think. And again, if you like the show, please give it a good rating on iTunes or Stitcher, wherever you stumbled across it. If you're not subscribed, why not? It costs nothing. It's free. And recommend it to your friends. The more people get listening to this and rating it, the more effective we would be at getting this message out. So again, here's the interview with Dr. Amat. Enjoy. So I'm here with my friend, Dr. Baleen Amat, and today we're going to discuss direct primary care. It's something that most people, I would say, don't know much about. I'd say majority of physicians aren't too familiar with it either. Would you agree? Yes, I agree with that. Yeah, and so obviously this is primary care. I'm an anesthesiologist, and so I'm a specialist, and so I don't even know if you could do a direct primary care um, process. I know there are specialists who can participate in primary care and do the direct model in ways uh, certainly yes. with radiologists and pathologists and such. Um, but anyways, we're going to just discuss in general what it is, why you do it, and sort of the history of it, I guess, and certainly your journey. So first of all, thanks for being on the show. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's very exciting. Yes, very exciting, this uh, brand new podcast. Um, so the first question is, you know, how? what's your history in medicine, I guess, to get you not to the point of primary care, but sort of before you made the decision to switch. And we're not going to talk about any specific healthcare care um, systems. We're in West Michigan. I think people in West Michigan would probably be able to figure out who we're talking about. But I think really most of the things we're talking about are not specific to anything healthcare system here. I think everything that mm-hmm. you experience that any other people experience in primary care are the same no matter where you are in the country, right? I think yes. – the issues with third-party payers and government payers and things like that aren't any different in the way healthcare systems work, right? Yeah, I think it's uh, the same way everywhere in the U.S. Right. right so, all right. So, what? So, why don't you go through your journey, if you would? So, I was born in Mexico, Mexico City, big, huge city, and I always wanted to be a doctor since I was like five years old. I had my little plastic stethoscope and would just <laughs> practice on my dolls and my brothers, uh, whoever was around. And I always wanted to be a doctor. I just worked really hard through high school, got into med school in Spain, and then actually didn't finish at that time med school, some family reasons. So I went back to Mexico. I worked in other things and finally decided I 
I wanted to be a doctor. And so I went kind of late into med school in my 30s. And then um, I wanted to come to the U.S. to practice. I just like the way that in the United States is more open and you have more options to do what you want to do and help patients. And of course, I, being from Mexico, I also saw a big need in the Hispanic community of somebody mm-hmm. who speaks Spanish. Right. So in my, in my way, it was just a kind of perfect situation. I uh, trained hard to get to the U.S., did all my tests and everything, matched here in Grand Rapids, um, love the snow. People always ask me, why Grand Rapids? <laughs> I'm like, the weather, that got me. And then I just uh, trained here. I did Med Pete's. Uh, as you know, it's a four-year program, internal medicine and pediatrics combined. Right. Um, and then when I finished residency, I, I just was employed by the hospital for about, I would say, six years. And okay. then that's when then I transitioned to doing direct care last year. So, um, so you went to primary care. That was obviously your passion. And you just yes. basically, I mean, medical pe- med peds, for those who aren't physicians, is Basically, family practice minus the obstetrics part, right? Yes, I mean, exactly. <laughs> which actually very few family family practice physicians practice obstetrics, I think, except maybe out in the very rural areas or underserved. Mm-hmm. Very true. Reservations and things like that. Yeah, I, I never liked the obstetrics. It always scared me. So yeah. I, I was like, how can I do family medicine without doing obstet- obstetrics? And that was med peds. Right. And, and I found anesthesia. I love obstetrics because it's the, one of the few places where patients are, you know, awake. <laughs> they can thank you for things. And it's a happy place generally. But it is very scary in many it ways. Is, it's yeah. very unpredictable and things that can change very quickly uh, for, the, for good or for bad. Um, so – you were practicing for six years in sort of what you consider traditional practice. And so why don't you describe what a traditional, well, you were in a larger healthcare system, but probably it's not much different if you're in a small five physician practice either, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. what is the, what's, what's the average patient load and um, what is the, what is your routine in a day? So I think one of the hardest things of primary care in the latest years, I would say 10, maybe 20 years is the volume of patients you have to see in a day. So you start slow when you graduate. You just kind of start building up your practice. Most of the times, there's already a panel waiting for you. Either somebody retired or all the other physicians are booked. So you get already a panel of patients that are waiting for you. Right. So I would say the routine of a day is you come in the morning, you check labs and things that are pending from maybe the day before. So you're just like paper, paper, paper. Um, and then it just starts and your day already starts behind because usually, (laughs) you know, you schedule somebody by the time they get put in the room with all the clicks, the medical assistant has to do for uh, meaningful use or whatever new, um, gig, the government or the insurance company want. Right. Um, it takes 15, 20 minutes to room a patient and the appointment's 15 minutes. So you already start your day behind. And by the end of the day, you see anywhere between 18 to 24 patients. If it's internal medicine, usually a PEDS probably more than that. Mm-hmm. So pretty much it's just you have three patients at, at a time roomed in, and you just go from room to room to room. In my situation, I could never do my notes while I was talking to patients. I can't. I don't have that double-track brain where I can type and talk. Mm -hmm. So I always would leave the notes to the end of the day and I paid for it because obviously then I would stay two, three hours to do notes at the end of the day. And I always worked five days a week. Mm -hmm. So then whatever I didn't finish, then I had to do on the weekend. So my weeks were pretty much whatever primary care doctors are doing. I I think if there's primary care doctors listening, they're probably sympathizing to, yes, you finish a day and then you're two, three, four hours doing paperwork, doing notes, doing, filling out, you know, medical forms or um, insurance claims and things like that that you have to fill out or Medicare forms. And then your weekends also catching up on labs. And of course, the panels are huge. You know, patient panel is about 3,000 patients. Sometimes more if you're supervising, if you're overseeing nurse practitioners or PAs, then those patients are yours too. Okay. So you have to sign up all the paperwork for those patients too. And sign out the notes from the PAs and the nurse practitioners, review them, make sure that, you know, patients are being treated appropriately. Mm-hmm. And so it takes a lot of time. And you've probably seen the studies, you know, for every hour you spend with patients, you spend two hours doing paperwork. Right. And it's not, and nowadays it's not actually paperwork, right? I mean, you're doing clicks mm-hmm. on the computer, clicks, but effectively it's yes. the same thing. If, if nothing else, because it's so simple to click, 
why don't we just put 10 clicks in where you, before yeah. you didn't and gather more information that is not meaningful to your practice anyways would you and i think right? every few weeks they would come up with let's in, a meeting and well now we have to do this new measure and it's only three clicks well that's three <laughs> clicks added to maybe the 350 you're already doing right. multiply by 24 patients it, it it adds nothing to patient care honestly it adds nothing to quality of care either right to outcomes to patient satisfaction, to physician satisfaction. It doesn't add anything. Right. Except clicks. So you're working, we'll say, at least 50 hours a week. Oh, yeah. Right. You're doing, you're doing five, eight-hour days. You're getting a couple hours. And then certainly you never, ever leave the office, right? You're never. still, although that's the case for most people in primary care, even no matter how you practice, you're probably you're always sort of thinking of that person who came in maybe couldn't quite figure it out or you're worried that what's going to happen to them or their family situation, whatever it might be. So... A lot of that is spent looking at a screen or, you know, looking at yes. in the past, looking at a chart and you're gathering information for people who may not, who aren't physicians. When we're talking about a panel, that's actually just a collection of all the patients you have. And that's what we refer to as a panel. Uh, and so it's very large. If you can imagine if you've got 3000 people, you're not, you know, even if you're, you're not seeing everyone once a year. Yeah. Even if you're seeing once a year, which you know you're seeing more, right? I mean, yeah. there are times you're squeezing right, people right, in, you're sir. double booking and yep. trying to get people in. Uh, so it's a tremendous amount of people to try and keep track of and to try and, and to try and, in, you know, eight hours, you're trying to see 25, you're, you're basically pushing it. If you've got someone who's complicated, who's coming mm-hmm. in with 12 medications. You, yeah. And I think one of the frustrations from patients is, uh, you know, you can only talk about one issue because there's only you know, 10 minutes or five minutes, the average primary care visit is seven minutes. And I can tell you sometimes it's less than that. Sure. Because yeah. you're already behind. You don't want people mad at you. So mm-hmm. you just run and run and run. And patients are not that easy. I mean, internal medicine, some of those patients are really complicated. They have 15 medications and four specialists you have to juggle and try to help the patient with whatever issue they have that day. Right. So it does, it does take more than 15 minutes for sure. Sure. And you're not like my wife who's a pediatrician who just stands, hands out stickers, right? That doesn't take much time. That's <laughs> <laughs> my friend, Dr. Eggerson. I love playing with the kids and you can sit down and draw with them. Yeah, it's right. Uh, so you're doing this for six years and some epiphany happens, right? Something happens that you, or at, when did you kind of think that you wanted to practice medicine? Because, you know, so all of us who go to medical school, um, at least in this country, your picture is that Norman Rockwell painting, right? There's mm-hmm. a doctor who's got yes. his bag open. He's at someone's house. There's some, you know, Timmy bumped his knee and he's like looking at Timmy and putting bandage on or something. And so I think lots of us think of that as sort of, that's the doctor, right? The doctor comes in, he's clearly spending some time. He's got a personal relationship with the patient yes. and he's treating whatever it is. So that's clearly not what it is, right? Anyone it's who's not. been to a doctor knows that's not, I mean, you, you get in, you you hardly see the doctor, right? I mean, you spend yeah, most of your time seeing the front somebody. desk, mm-hmm. the you know, person mm-hmm. checks you in, the nurse comes back, et cetera. So what changed for you? Well, it's about maybe two years out of residency that I just was not happy. I just was always running around, never knew who the patients were. It was like, who is this? And I could not remember them. And it just so sad and frustrating. And it was not what I wanted to do. So it took me a while to figure out what I wanted to do. I, did, I just knew it, that was not for me. And as you said, you have a picture in your brain of what it should be. Mm-hmm. And it did not match. I was very disappointed of the system and just saying, this is not the way. And I pushed back. I tried to change the system within. I think we all try. Mm-hmm. Got involved as much as I could all the way to the top in all the committees. And I was in meetings with CFOs and everything. And it's still, it was, it's impossible. There's no way to change the system from within. It was very frustrating. Nothing moves. It's like the Titanic, you know. Right. Just, like a good friend said, you know, it's like the Titanic hitting the iceberg and then backing up and hitting it again <laughs> uh, in those meetings. So in the end, I think that the administration is so removed from patient care and the doctors are so, so removed from the administration that you get this huge disconnect of people that are in the trenches taking care of patients and people who are making the decisions of how to see patients. I tried. I got burnt out. I just was very unhappy. It got to a point, I think my my moment was when my husband said, maybe you're not meant to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. And it just hit me hard because I was like, what? This is what I always wanted to do since I was five years old. I, I 
never considered a plan B. There's no plan B. This is what I wanted to do. And it just didn't match. And then once I said, I need to do something else, then I started looking for answers. And that's when I found direct primary care. And so I think, you know, it's fair to look at the way practice works now, uh, whether you're working for a large system or whether you're even in private practice, I mean, is ultimately you still have to have a large patient panel. You still have to see patients that sort of volume. If you want to over, you know, recoup your overhead, right? Yes. I mean, your overhead's pretty tremendous in medicine, well, in primary it takes care. Like it's eight, eight, eight staff members to help one physician in primary care. Right. That's and so, who are those people? Front staff, Front receptionist, staff, billing, coding. Billing, right. Even if you're in a large system, you still have a bunch of builders and coders that have to. Right. And Process so it's, the claims. and it, It's the billing and coding, too, that I think yes. no one sees. And, and that goes back to your point, too, where you have someone come in and you just see one, you take care of one problem. Because mm-hmm. from a billing standpoint, there's, there's no advantage just to taking care of three problems at once. Yes. Right? And you also don't get reimbursed for all the extra work you do exactly. through the day. So the only way you make money is by seeing more patients. Right. So they're always, you're always in the red. Mm-hmm. The six years I was in the system, I was always in the red. I always had to see more patients, and I just couldn't. Yeah. Well, I and I think, do it. and I think no one can really. I mean, I think some people think they can multitask and type while they're listening. I don't think. I mean, I, I even try to listen to a podcast while I'm doing something. If I do anything that has a, any sort of intellectual, like driving, I'm, <laughs> well, <laughs> driving, maybe I can probably drive and kind of pay attention but, but again you're right if you're in some place that you don't recognize you can't mm-hmm. you miss stuff right i mean yes and in medicine it's, that's the difference in missing a diagnosis somewhere you either yeah. you either give up on the routine stuff or you don't check the medications properly mm-hmm. or you didn't read all the notes or you didn't read all the labs right so there's something somewhere you gotta cut if you have to see that many patients and, and so in some ways there's no way to if you're in this there's still no way to change it i mean no. if because you're, if, even if the, the health system said, you do whatever you think's best, and you, you still can't do it because ultimately you have Blue Cross Blue Shield or some other insurance company that's saying, well, we have these 27 measures you need to make sure. We need to know the patient demographics. We need to make even sure. Even though we have proved that doing those quality measures does not improve quality of patient right. care, outcomes in health, nothing. You, we're still doing them. And it doesn't matter if you're part of a big system or if you're a solo doc. Right. The complaints are the same. Yeah, right. So absolutely. So this doesn't blame anybody. Is it is the system failure? Yeah, right. I think, and I think that's the key, right? So, so you got to this point. You said, "Well, I've kind of tried everything inside, mm-hmm. and it's I might as well just be smash my head against the wall some more." Yep. So, so how did you? Hear, so direct primary care. I guess explain what it was that you heard and why. What drew you to it, and then just kind of explain what it is. I guess for yes. because. Most people listening to this are not going to know, but should know. So the first I heard was an article about um, Gerson Bliss, who was kind of the grandfather of direct primary care in Seattle. And I believe it's on Time magazine. Don't quote me on that. But I read about this, and he was talking about going back to medicine and the patient-doctor relationship. And and I was like, that's what I want. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? And I would Google and couldn't find a lot of information. So like two, three years that I was trying to look – but then I got sucked back into the black hole of doing my notes, and I just didn't have the energy. To you might look. have been busy, right? Possibly. A little, <laughs> a little bit busy. Had a baby in the middle, so it also <laughs> kind of sidetracked me. Always blamed the baby. Yep. Um, That's why we're parents, right? You got to have someone to blame when something happens, right? Yeah. Oh, yes, those kids. And so I, I, I kind of slowly started reading more about it. And then in one of my frustrations, I actually saw there was a conference. And this was two years ago almost three, that I saw a conference called um, Nuts and Bolts, Direct Primary Care Nuts and Bolts. And it's done by the Docs for Patient Care um, Foundation, which is a foundation that actually is about doctors educating patients and other doctors. So they, they put up this conference in Dallas. And I went and I told my husband, I'm going to go to this conference by myself. This is not a vacation. I am going to concentrate on this. If this is what... It is. I'm taking the leap. If not, I'm going to stop complaining mm-hmm. about my job. Because he was, he was also obviously tired of hearing me complain all day long about how horrible it was. Right, and a crying baby. Yes. Right. I was like, okay, I'm going <laughs> to be done with complaining, and this is what it is, yeah, and that's right, it. right. So I went to that conference, and I called him 
so excited the first night, like just after meeting people. I didn't even like it, the conference hadn't even started <laughs> just from the people I met that were doing this. And I was like, you can't do that. Really? Can you do this? How? And, you know, just talking to doctors that were already doing this. I called my husband and said, this is it. I'm, I'm doing this. And I just came back from that conference, financially started doing some changes in our life to be able to take the leap and just did it. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, quit my job and open shop. And just, <laughs> and just uh, yeah, right. You just kind of have to make the leap and hope it all works out, right? So I'm in your office now. Um, this is, like I mentioned, we met. I, this is the most modest office. I mean, you would not know this is... In fact, when I'm walking in, there's a, the waiting room's pretty big. I mean, and it's pretty small in that sense, actually. <laughs> You've got a couple of chairs, and there's just a one, one exam room. You've just got your one office. And, you know, you have more excess room. Yes. I mean, you have more room here than you need. And mm -hmm. you said, what, 1,000 square feet? I have 1,000 square feet, which is one patient room, because I only see one patient at a time. I don't have to have people waiting for me. Mm -hmm. I have a small lab where I have some medications and some procedures like, you know, urine tests, strep throat, things like that. And then I have a office slash pharmacy and some storage room. And then the waiting room, which is not really a waiting room because nobody waits. Mm -hmm. They just kind of sit and hang out. <laughs> It's like, a, it's like a, you need to have coffee. like, yeah, right, a coffee bar, huh? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And so how, so how does direct primary care work? So we've, we've now gone from eight people to take, yes. to help you get patients ready, mm -hmm. seeing three patients an hour, right yes. about or something about. like that to now you're seeing how many patients an hour? Well, I see in a very busy day, I might see eight patients, eight patients in a full day, in a full day. So it's now, a patient an hour. Okay, average. and would you say your panel's full or not? I'm quite probably full? about half full. About half. So at you know at capacity, you're seeing twice as many patients. So you're seeing maybe not half. I guess so. You need, here's here's okay. what's important about direct primary care is it's a membership model. So patients pay anywhere from ten to seventy five dollars a month every month, mm -hmm. and that includes all their office visits, their online visits like texting, conference calls, whatever we need to do is included in that price. Office procedures like a strep test or a NEB machine treatment or an EKG, A1C, anything that I do in the office is included in that price. So the wonderful thing about that is I don't have to physically see the patient to make money. Okay, right. So I don't have to bring them in for every A campaign, every sniffle. A lot of stuff can be done and managed over the phone. Mm -hmm. If I need to see them, if it's clinically appropriate, I do see them. If I don't have to... I don't need to. Okay. Because it's part of the membership thing is you already kind of got your spot in the office, but you don't physically have to see the patient for everything to get paid. So in a way it decreases your volume of visits that you have to do in a day because I don't have anybody that tells me you have to see this patient this many times in a year. Right. I do what's clinically appropriate, what's the standard of care. I don't have to bring them in to make sure this and that. You know, I just decide based on I know the patients, which is very important to me. Right. So you know I the know ones who, who are. might be sick and who are just, exactly. you know, not It's sick. like, oh, you got again the same issue. Okay, how about we baby it with this, this, this. Do this over the counter. Mm -hmm. Call me in a couple of days. And I think the follow-up is amazing because I can keep track of more stuff than I was able to because of the panel size. Because I don't have that many patients. I can actually take better care of the patients that I have right now. And I could do even a control study, you know, with me and my patients before and after mm -hmm. and some patients that followed me and I take way better care of them now. It's kind of embarrassing that you're like, I missed this or that, or, you know, I didn't have the time to review your medications. Right. And actually it's, hum it's a humbling experience because you have to accept this in front of the patient and say, you know what, I think this was not the best for you. Let's try this other thing. And you can try other things and you have the time to talk to patients or say, I didn't realize you were taking all these supplements that, by the way, is, is interacting with your medication, mm -hmm. but you didn't never had the time to sit down and talk about that or their life. I didn't even know you had kids. I didn't even know that you, you know, worked as an engineer doing whatever it is. So getting to know the people has helped me be a better doctor because I can take care of the whole picture and not just the medication management. Right. Anybody can do medication management. Sure. Well, I, I mean, what you describe is what I think anyone who goes to medical school, that's what they think oh, of doctors, yes. right? I mean, I hate using the term holistic, but it certainly is, there's, right, 
you know, I feel like in medicine, many times we're um, we're expected to treat people with an algorithm. Yes, and you see a lot of medicine, especially um, well, with the larger health systems, hospitals, and and there are some. There's definitely some safety in in using algorithms and uh, safety checks and things like that, but. I think you know not recognizing that people are unique and different. I think is is very unusual, and that yes. because it's not like we bring in Toyota 1988 Toyota Corollas in, and we know where the carburetor is every time, mm-hmm. right? I mean, everybody's different. Everything's someplace yes. different. They react differently to things, and the psychological aspects of life, you know, affect things. And so, yes. if you don't treat that or understand it, it changes the way you treat people, right? I mean, and there's little things just like having the medications. I dispense the medications as you, I saw you in my pharmacy. I know if the patients are taking the medications because I'm in charge of the refills. <laughs> so the system tells me all oh, they're due for a refill. I text them or call them and say, hey, how are you doing for your pills? Oh, I still have plenty. Well, they're probably taking it wrong. How many times are you taking it a day? Oh, just once. Yeah, you never read the label, right? That it says twice a day. <laughs> so of course you have leftover. So it brings up the conversation of like, oh, okay, maybe I didn't explain you need to take this twice a day. Mm-hmm. Oh, maybe that's why I'm not doing so well. And it just brings all this detail in taking care of the patient that I never had time to do. Because you just send send a prescription to the pharmacy, you never know if they pick it up. Sure, yeah. And you don't... by the time you see them back, maybe it's months later. And you certainly don't know how they're how compliant they are with it because I mean I can't tell you how many people I see around twenty medications. I'm like, there's no way that you're taking twenty medications taking properly. I, I mean, it's possible, but it's highly unlikely, right? I mean, I think they've done mm-hmm. many studies showing that once you get to about exactly. five or six medicines, people are forgetting one or the other, or they've now forgotten one's BID instead of the other one or whatever, and they're exactly and they're doing things wrong. So I think being able to follow up on those things and looking at the pic- the whole picture of maybe this person can't afford those medications why that's why they're not taking them or maybe they you know work nights and you're trying to get them to take something three times where is that where they're working or is that when they're supposed to be sleeping <laughs> right. and they, they can't pick up medications up because they're working or they don't have transportation or they don't have money or they don't you know there's all these variables that right. we don't have time yeah we're rushing right. and because it basically you have um as that person's moving through an office in a traditional practice, they're going to have contact with four or five people because some yes. of the people are in the back office that they never meet. But all those people have a piece of their story. Yes. Right? But not everyone has all the pieces. And if you've been a patient, how annoying is it to call and have to talk to three different people and tell them the story again and again and again? Oh, let me transfer you. And you get transferred again, and nobody's paying attention to you as a person. Right. It's, it's just so much easier to get, you know, simpler. It's like calling an Alzheimer's Direct. unit, right? <laughs> so yes. They keep forgetting everything. <laughs> right? Exactly. So, yeah, it, uh, it, it's sort of like when you call and you have to enter a credit card number, and then you, they get someone on the line, and they say, well, can you give What's me a credit number? card? Right. You just punched <laughs> well, it just, in. Right, exactly. exactly. What's the point of that? Right. Very annoying. Uh, so life has changed significantly for you. Yes. Obviously much better. Yes. Is it? How do you think your things have changed at home? I mean, with your, oh, with your kid it's, and it's your husband? It's night and day. It's night and day. Uh, my kid, when I was employed, I don't think she liked me very much. Mm-hmm. She didn't see me very much. And when I was home, I was always sitting by the computer doing notes or whatever. Right. And um, I was cranky. I was not very nice. Mm-hmm. You know, I was just like all yeah. the time angry at everything. Um, and I, I was thinking about this yesterday. Is the only way you can control your priorities and your quality of life is if you have a say in your day. So mm-hmm. if you have control over your schedule, something so easy as your schedule, and I can say, I am going to take my daughter to the dentist myself. Right. And I just block that time myself mm-hmm. on my schedule. And then I decide, you know, that day, maybe we'll make it a mama daughter day and we'll go watch a movie afterwards. Mm-hmm. I can do that. And it does not affect my patients because I block the time and I'm still available. They can text me. They can call me. And it doesn't interrupt my quality time because I'm not answering the phone in the movie theater, but I'm available still. Sure. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? Right. Nothing is an emergency in primary care. There's very few things that you have to answer the phone. Like, I tell my patients, if you're on the floor unconscious and bleeding, don't call me. <laughs> call 911. Right. That's right? why God invented ambulances, right? Exactly. <laughs> so don't get to the Primary hospital. care is mostly like, I need a refill. I need an appointment. Right. I, ha- I have a cough that's Doctors not going know. away. Right, or right. you have a side effect. It's usually things that can wait a couple hours. Mm-hmm. So quality of life has significantly changed because I have 
I think, more autonomy and more control over things. And kind of being the boss is nice. Yeah. I'm very bossy, so as, I like being the boss. As long as you don't mind being a boss. I like it. That's I, kind of the doctor's thing. I call the shots. You know, <laughs> yeah, I, right. I, I decide how often the trash is taken out. I decide, you know, how my office is set up. I, set, I decide how many patients I see in a day. Right. And if I need to catch up on something, I block some time for that. So, <clears throat> so we're sitting here in the, your office. Again, that's a pretty simple little office. Yeah. And the way direct primary care works, so traditionally you have insurance, you pay it, maybe a copay when you go show up for the doctor, and mm-hmm. then you go and get, you know, you go see your doctor or whatever. So here's a, obviously it's a membership model. And so if I have it, if I have it understanding correctly, basically I pay a certain amount. I have probably some sort of insurance somewhere, yes. whether it's a government payer like Medicare or Medicaid. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe I don't have any insurance, uh, but I already have an insurance through my em- employer, but I maybe have an HSA or have a large copay or something like that, mm-hmm. that I can now pay a monthly fee to have unlimited access basically to you. Mm-hmm. And there are other benefits that I get besides just being able to come hound you on the phone or something like that, right? Yes. Like So so what are the other things that, that direct primary care offers the average patient that they may think there's a benefit to besides just being able to get to here. So I think besides, obviously, the access and the directness of it, um, I do have medications wholesale. So I can I can be pretty much any pharmacy. So give me an example of uh, maybe two common drugs and the difference in price fr- from here. So and I can here. get 1,000 Lysinopril for $10. 1,000. Now, that's generic, right? <laughs> yes. Lisinopril. So how much is a lisinopril? So how much would that cost at so a you, common... You can get it. There's a couple of pharmacies in town that have a $4 list. So you get 30 days for $4. So you get 30 for $4. Yeah. And for me, it'd be like 50 cents for 30 days. So you save 350 Yeah. A month if you're on... Which is a family, engineer. you know. Well... If it's three medications and you save them 10, 15 bucks a sure. month. Yeah, yeah. It adds up. Mm-hmm. Some medications might be maybe with... I, I just had a patient the other day, and with the insurance, so he's on steroids to survive because he's got Addison's disease. Okay. So he needs to be on steroids forever, and the pharmacy and the um, insurance will not give him more than a month at, at a time. Mm-hmm. So he can only get one month at a time, which is not very convenient, and he pays about maybe $50 for his prescription. Well, I can get him the same exact prescription for 30 Mm-hmm. And I can also give him three months at a time because I don't have to, you know, condition anything. I'm thinking of his benefit right. of not having, of course, I'm not going to give him like, you know, an endless supply of sure. medication because I'm still going to want to see him and everything. So it's probably not good that he has a stash of steroids. But you can say, you know, here's what's appropriate. You need this medication to survive. Mm-hmm. I don't want you to run out of medication. Right. So yeah. here's three months. Let's plan on your next visit when you need medication and you save maybe twenty, thirty, forty, fifty dollars every three months on your prescription. And you're not taking those extra trips that to the pays pharmacy. For the membership. Waiting yeah, right. Just the savings in the medications is not the first one that I have found that have insurance that actually what they're saving in their medications, even with insurance, pays for the membership. Right, because you know you you have a guaranteed copay for your medications, maybe, and yes. So, so and know, if, if it's that. the beginning of the year, you're paying most of it. Sure. So if you your deductible, if you ever hit your deductible, right? Nowadays, it's yeah harder to hit the deductible. So I think that's one of the benefits is the medication savings, and the other one is um, imaging. So I have, and that'd be like X-rays or things, yes, right? X-rays, yeah. CAT scans, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, there's an imaging center couple hours from here so there's nobody in town that's independent so there's an independent radiology center that we can get cash pricing and they have the, they have the prices online so it's not like i have a special you haven't negotiated deal some them. deal nothing mm-hmm. this is their price online and i can get so let's say in town i can get a cat scan for about 1500 bucks with them it's about 300 and that's including the reading that's a pre- professional reading. fee from yes. a radiologist. Because the cheapest I can get around here is about twelve hundred plus the reading, and the reading is usually three to four hundred dollars. Sure. Well, I can get the full study cash for three hundred, four hundred bucks. And we're talking about quality. This is not like out of someone's oh, no. barn, right? I mean, this no, is no. This is a, a good quality radiology center that has eight different locations. This is not oh, okay. just some dingy, you right? Know, yeah, 
back office. Where we had a plastic basement. surgeon here who was <laughs> operating a pole barn. Yeah, <laughs> not that kind of Actually, medicine. it wasn't plastic. It was a cardiologist. And, I think it was, but yeah, right. and they're nice to the patients. Mm-hmm. They're efficient. They do the studies super quick. They give you a CD. So then if you see a specialist, you have the images. And it's just a perfect situation. And I've had patients that needed, you know, a knee MRI. Well, you get a knee MRI for, for $270. And you get the CD. Yes, and you get the CD. You it's pay true. 270 You don't get a bill afterwards for a facility fee. You know, you right? paid for the whole thing. Why not? Why would you want to use your insurance and pay the full price if you can pay cash? Right, and so, yeah, I mean, you go to Sears, they charge you for the CD, so that's actually a pretty good deal. Um, <laughs> uh, so... I mean, that's – and then do you have things for labs too? I mean, you're, yes, some so people I, have I labs. I do have uh, kind of contracts with two different labs where we do what's called bill pay. So what they do is they bill me instead of billing the patient. Oh, and that I way I can get very good pricing. So, for example, a CBC is $3.50. Oh, okay. You know, a CMP, which is your chemistry usually panel, is about $4.00. Okay. And lipid panel is about $4. And do you draw the blood here then too? I don't because I don't have the staff yet. Right. Oh, yeah. So And so it's a little too much. So you just send them to their that. lab They in just town. go to the yeah. lab. Mm-hmm. It's $3 for the actual lab draw. And they so they just kind of basically they'll so they'll pay their membership and they'll pay an additional whatever for an that extra maybe, to you and then they yep. bill you. So they just walk into the place just get their test and leave they don't have to, another leave. transaction. Mm-hmm. And then they pay me whatever the $12 or $8 for the blood work. Right. So it's a lot simpler for them. I mean, the whole process is very easy for patients. So you've had patients who followed you, it sounds like. Yeah. How do they, what's, their, what's been their response to this program, A, paying extra money? Did they, were they hesitant about that? Is that something they thought I they were going to? I think so. I think at first, but I think when patients follow you, and it's hard for you to see you because you're an anesthesiologist, so you don't have that. Yeah, it's best if patients certainly. don't follow me. <laughs> um, um, most of them are asleep, like you said. Yeah. Um, but usually patients that follow you already love you. Right. So mm-hmm. they're not, they don't have a problem paying because they value you as a person and they value you as a physician and you've taken care of them and they've seen you maybe through the good and bad. But I have seen my patients say you're a lot happier and <laughs> yeah. it shows. Oh, yeah. They, I'm and sure they can pick up on that quickly. So I think, I don't think that they have a problem paying. I don't think that's the problem usually. It's more the understanding of the whole picture of how does it work with insurance. Right. You know, what, what am I getting? Not just seeing you and we mm-hmm. love you is what else is there? So for them, I think it's more the convenience and the access a lot of times than, you know, maybe they have Medicare or Medicaid. They don't really pay a lot in medications or in labs. Right. So it depends. I always try to look for, for what's best for them. Sure. And so do they, the ones... They tell you that it's, they like the they like the setup more than the, the previous one. Yes, I mean is that I well, guess it, universally they would say that because they're the ones still here, yeah, right? But exactly. Have you had many leave that came? Well, I in think the- there's always some attrition. I don't have anybody that followed me that has left me. Okay, um, but within any office, I think there's some attrition. Some well, people, sure. you know, it's funny because they you know they might contract with me. Well, they don't have insurance, and they get insurance, and then they yeah. get a doctor within the system. And I can tell you about 50% of those come back okay. because they try to get in. They can't get in. They don't see the same doctor. Then they see a PA, and then you know, they, they're like, I just can't get anything I, I want back. Right. And so they do come back. Mm-hmm. I would say about half of the people that leave come back because they just, you know, once you have this relationship, it's really hard Yeah. to go back to a big system. Sure. You get like you know a glimpse of something very nice and very personal. Right, you gone from personal to impersonal, right? Mm-hmm. So it's hard to, mm-hmm. especially if you value that relationship. I mean, yes. that's, I mean, that's why, that's why traditionally doctors were so were so highly esteemed in their communities because they had a personal relationship with all their with you everybody see in town. People in the worst times and the best times, yeah. right? You see them when they have their kids and where somebody dies or where somebody's sick, right? So you become part of who they are, and I think I. I I had a little sense of that when I did my rural service in Mexico. We had to do a one-year rural service to get a license. So everybody has to do that, mm-hmm. every physician. And I did get a feel, a little bit of that family doctor, little small-town rural doctor that goes into the homes and sees the patients with your little doctor bag. Right. So I already had that feel. 
And this is a way to kind of recover that and say, this is a way that you can treat patients, I, I think, better. And also, it's better for me. Right. I mean, you've said it's personally, like it feels better. And yeah. certainly decreasing your stress level improves your health and your, <laughs> we all and your that, longevity, right. right? Yes. So, okay. So the next question, it, so there are two types of people who are listening to this, I think. There's a patient's listening to this and you're like, hmm, that's an interesting concept. Maybe I should look into this. There are physicians, and there are two types of physicians. There are ones who are in training and there are ones who are currently established, right, who yes. might have be interested in, interested in direct primary care and want to find out more. So the, question, the first question is, well, okay, so this sounds like kind of a, oh, fly by, you see your pants sort of operation. It doesn't sound like it's going to pay very well. Like if, you know, I got my family, I've got my loans, I'm coming out of medical school, average middle school is about a quarter million dollars now. So mm-hmm. I got to pay that off at some point. Yeah. Is this something that's economically viable for a primary care physician? I think so. I think it's not, probably the the kind of scary thing is the beginning. So yes, you have a very big salary with the hospital and now you're going to jump ship and you're a business owner. So now you have to finance this operation. Right. And well, one of the first things to go out the door is your income. Mm-hmm. So you have to supplement your income some other ways. So that's most people that do direct care, they'll work in something else for a year or two until the business takes off, until they're able to say, sustain sure. the business. So you're talking about like, I'm going to work urgent care for a little bit. Exactly. Or- so people work urgent care or... They'll do locums or prison system, or I do hospice on the side, mm-hmm. and now I like it. So now it's not a <laughs> You're money issue. Now. Yeah. It's, now I like it. I'm yeah. hooked. But there's many ways that we can make money in the meantime. Okay. I think that if you if you are very careful about your finances and not spend a ton of money up front mm-hmm. and don't hire a lot of staff, I mean, all the things that build into your right. overhead and you make smart decisions, you can pay yourself sure. you know, within a few months. I mean, how many staff do you have here? I uh, zero. Zero. <laughs> so your staff, you've gone from eight people to zero at this point, yes. right? And so, from an overhead standpoint, I mean, everyone knows the labor is the biggest overhead. Yes. And then second would be facilities and you know rent, but your footprint's pretty small here. So yes. I would so imagine rent was that's one of the biggest decisions because I looked at doctor's offices to rent. And they're all huge. Right. You need like five partners in this yeah. sort of model to and, make it And work. I was not going to be able to afford that. And I, I kind of set my goal and said, I need an office where I pay this amount and that's my budget. Right. And then look for what office I can fit into and make it mine. So you have to be flexible, but you also have to be very careful not to spend a lot of money. In- sure. So if you were go- so you could, the two models, mo- you could either go, if you're an established physician, you can go and start working other side jobs, we'll call them. Yes. Uh, or you could just take out a loan and say, I'm just going to go you in. You can take a loan. Right. I mean, yeah. <laughs> there's I don't one like thing. Loans. Well, I, I personally with you. don't like loans. Uh, I come from a country where the banks just get, you know, taken by the government and the next day there's a revolution <laughs> and then there's a hurricane and earthquake. So I, I don't like loans personally. Right. Uh, besides my house, I don't have any loans because I just don't like Yeah, them. no, I understand. But there are people that have done direct care and they've been able to pay their loans off. So I think it's, there's ways to do it. You probably have to be creative and you have to kind of look at your family situation. So it's not for everybody. You have to see what sure. support you have at home. You know, are you the sole breadwinner or is your a partner helping or not helping? How much can they mm-hmm, put right. into the pot? Your life expenses too, I think, as doctors. And I don't know it because we've been the pride for so long. Yes, there's that. We um, get out of residency and buy uh-huh. the huge house and the huge lifestyle. And then, then it becomes you, you stuck to your job to pay your lifestyle. Right. Yeah, no, I think, I think there's that um, sort of... Uh, held back consumerism that we all have and like, okay, I'm just, you know, living in, I hate to say poverty. It's not fair because you know, if you looked at a resident salary, it's like 50, some thousand dollars, mm-hmm. but that half, most of that goes towards your loans and your living. I and mean, it's really nothing because uh, yeah, you you're usually really in a big much. city or something mm-hmm. and you end up with, you know, nothing really. I mean, you may, if you're making payments on a quarter million dollars, you're, <laughs> you're barely keeping up with interest if, if that, right. Uh, so I think it's probably easier for doctors to come out of residency and do direct care. I would think so, that right? you've been paid the bazillion dollars because you already are not making a lot of money. But I mean, I guess the, so I guess the question is, you know, when you look at from the comparison to pay, is a pay that different? I mean, I, I imagine that if you're in a private practice, you're probably your income's greater, but obviously your expenses are tremendously greater too, right? Yes. So you're 
take home is maybe is it the same or I think if it depends how big you want to get and how much of a hassle you want. You mean for if either direct primary or yes. Yeah, so sure. I think. I always, when I was in the system, I always said, I don't want to make that much money. I don't care. I really want to just see this many patients in a day. There was no option to do that. You right. work this many hours, you see this many patients, you make this much. But I don't want to make that much. Sure. I don't really need that. And it didn't matter. Is this, this is cookie cutter. You know, this is how much you mm-hmm. have to make. Now, can you make the same salary or more? You can. But like always, it comes with a price. Because obviously, the more yeah, you're members busier. you have... Then mm-hmm. you need staff. Then. So I think there's probably a balance of your lifestyle that you decide how big you want to get and how much money you want to make. So if you're, I mean, if you have a thousand patients, that'd be pretty big for direct primary yes. care, right? I think most direct primary care doctors find it like full practice would be about six to 800 patients. So I have to do the math and round up in uh, so we say 50. 10. So if, you, so if it's $50 a month time, mm-hmm. that's 600 a year for per, per patient. Per patient. If you have a yep. thousand in a panel, that'd be, what's that? Six? You're asking me to do math on my Yeah, a thousand times. <laughs> so, and, but you're doing half that. So, I mean, that's still a pretty good income because your expenses are pretty most, low. Most people that have that 50 kind of price range, if they have a full practice, they make about two hundred. I mean, that's a year. really good for primary care. Yeah. I mean, especially talk about a national average. Some hospitals might pay more or some less, but yeah, but that always comes average. with it, and that comes with the cost. I mean, I guess you're maybe that doesn't your salary in those hospitals might come with benefits, and so there's some yes. you know trade off there, but that's still pretty good. I mean, that's good income, and that's if you have got a quarter million dollars of debt, if you live not a Spartan life, but you know simple life for a couple of years, you can pay off that loan yes. in a reasonable amount of time. I, I mean, if you plan things, which right. was, I think, my point when I said you, when I decided to jump ship to when I really jump ship, sure. there was some time there yeah. where we were like, okay, do we really need this huge house? No, we can downsize. So we downsized our house. Mm-hmm. I changed my car. You know, we got rid of a lot of stuff and we're actually happier because our obligations are not as bad. You know, you're like, oh, yeah, I can pay this. Sure. And I don't, I'm not stressed over money. Right. Because I don't have to worry so much about making so much money because we really cut back the, on the lifestyle before we went. Yeah. On and, this and you're at this point now where if you wanted, you could scale up if you, if you felt you had yeah. to, right? Yeah. I think now I'm, I'm at a very comfortable point where I'm paying myself. I'm not too busy. Mm-hmm. I'm busy as far as like getting new patients, but I'm not working 12 hours a day or things like that. And I, I think I'm kind of month by month going to see how big I want to get. Sure. Because I might get to a point that I need some staff, and that might be the breaking point where I say, do I really want to yeah. make that extra jump and get to 600? Then I probably need some Yeah, you, help. Need, you need, and then you need more. I do miss my old MAs so much. Oh, I, if it weren't for my wife's MA, I don't know that she'd get through oh, the day. Oh, goodness, yes. I, I, just, I just love the staff <laughs> and all yeah. I do for doctors, and they're underappreciated and probably underpaid. I don't know how much they make, but. They don't you know, make much. I know that. They have to do all the boring stuff of faxing, requesting mm-hmm. records, and ugh, it's just horrible work. Yeah, my wife makes them do all the vac- vaccinations, so she comes in. She's always the good guy. Of course. I always do that, too. <laughs> it's, I didn't one. know that was a primary care strategy. I with the stickers, yes. <laughs> I'll give them the stickers in the book. So, obviously, you do this again. Oh, In fact, in you probably would have started out this way, right? I, I think, you know, it has to be the right time mm-hmm. to do things, the right timing when you're ready. Um, you know, I wanted to work hard in the system as far as I could, as hard as I could, and try everything before I made the change. I didn't want to leave wondering, oh, maybe I could have done something different. You know, when times get hard, right, right. you don't want to wonder, oh, maybe I shouldn't have left. Yeah. So I left with the full awareness of I've tried it in many different ways, and I just can't make it work for me. Yeah. This is a personal choice. And this is a lot nicer. I, I like it better. I think my patients are getting much better care from me, and I'm not burnt out mm-hmm. and yeah. cranky all day. Right. Well, it's sort of like uh, when I do nerve blocks in patients. So they have, if they're having shoulder surgery, and they have, I can do a nerve block to, before surgery. So it anesthetize their arm. They can't feel anything. They wake up, whatever. Or I can wait until afterwards, which we don't do much. But some people are like, ah, I'll just wait to see how I feel. They are far more appreciative of that nerve block <laughs> than the people who get it beforehand because they're like, whoa, this is really bad pain. And yes. it's sort of like you, right? You had to almost 
experience the other side. Like, you wow, have this to is go just through it. And I think that's why, when you know, our direct care, we're kind of very gone ho about telling everybody how awesome this is. Some people have to go through the the right. pain to decide if that's what it's for them. You know, if you want to work and be employed, go ahead. I'm not saying everybody has to do this. You have to find your happy place. And some people are very happy doing, you know, hospital medicine or maybe doing outpatient in an FQHC or maybe working for a big hospital or having their, you know, partners and having an independent practice. I'm not saying it's for everybody. Because, right. you know, it's not all rainbows and unicorns. It's also a business, and you have to make business decisions that yeah, sure. we're not trained to do, right? We have, I had, I've had to learn so much about business, um, which I love, but I don't think everybody has that interest. Yeah, I, always, I, I do wonder sometimes if people would have more interest in it if they just realized that it was not so scary. It is not. I mean, it, it just, it's kind of like it's medicine, right? I mean, in some ways, it's sort of an experiment. We're going to try this medicine or try this exactly. marketing and then see if it works. And if We're it doesn't, we'll try something different. We're smart people, right? You got very good scores in school. You you like to study. We're big nerds. We always like a challenge. Yeah. It's like jumping off a cliff and realizing that the bottom of the cliff is only one foot away, right? But you didn't see the bottom. And once you jump and you're like, oh, that wasn't so bad. Yeah. So that's why I encourage people to try it because it's not that bad if you plan it. If you have you know enough time to plan ahead and you to make smart decisions, then mm-hmm. it's not that bad. I would warn uh, medical students who might be listening that the first year of medical school is that bad. And so that is actually <laughs> a 500 foot jump off a cliff. <laughs> but eventually you land, you'll be, you'll survive. You might be a little mangled and at the end. And we all say residence is horrible, right? Being a resident yeah. is horrible, but we would all go back. I would go back. I, I wouldn't. <laughs> so much fun. You didn't have fun? Oh, I had so much fun. Well, I mean, there are parts of it that are fun. I tell you, the one thing I did not enjoy is, to Being your, on call. Well, oh. no, I mean, I'm on call now as much maybe then. It, anesthesia residents a little bit funny, and it's not. My wife is a much more call. I mean, from a call standpoint, I think her call was worse than mine. Her PICU call was like oh. 36 hours straight. I mean, it's, is brutal. It was yes. terrible. Um, but the thing I, that I don't miss about anesthesia residency is that I would be, um, you know, I had to call the staff every day and tell them about how we're going to do the case. Mm-hmm. You know, because there are 100 ways to do put someone to sleep and wake them up. They all work. They're all safe. It just different styles, right? I mean, just like the way you might talk to people, it's just totally different. That's just, you know, individual. So anyway, I would have to adapt every day to what the staff wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And it was just frustrating because it's yeah. especially once you get out enough and have enough base knowledge that you know how to do it, you have your own preferences and you're like, you have your style. it's not the way I want to do it. I'd, I mean, I'll do it this way, whatever. And so it wasn't until I got to private practice that I wasn't sure that I really even liked anesthesia. I mean, I enjoyed oh. it. But mm-hmm. I thought the one thing that's really annoying is calling the staff and going, not knowing what's going to happen today. So it was actually refreshing after like a week. I'm like, this is great. <laughs> I can well, do whatever I want. I think the autonomy of being in practice is very different from residency. You don't have to look back and ask somebody, is it okay if I increase their metformin on a diabetic? You already know. Right. So yeah. I think it's good when you're done and you're like, oh, I can do this. So they're not releasing you too soon. You know, you're confident enough that you can make the decisions. Right. And, but I think that coming back to the business side, we don't get any training in that. And I think that would be nice. I think that it would be a good, you know, elective maybe to have, to learn about the business of medicine if you're interested. If you're not interested, then don't. But sure. if you want to learn, where do you go? What what do you have to learn? What are the different systems? What are, you know, how do you, how do you work within the prison system? I, you know, you never talk about things like that until you no. come out and you're like, I didn't even know that was a separate thing. You know, yeah, I still don't know. I, that surprised me. That is different. I mean, I, I see the prisoners, but I, for me, again, it's all the same pretty much. But that's an, And, um, you know, in medical school right now, in residency training, I guarantee they don't talk about this. No, I think it depends. I think in that sense, there might be more geographical influences. I think places that have more influence from maybe direct care or different styles of practice, the med students get to see it. Um, have you ever had one come here? I actually had a resident a couple of weeks ago okay. who's thinking of doing the same thing I'm doing. Neat. Okay. And it was very cool to see somebody who's in residency and knows about this because I didn't know about it until I was out. Mm-hmm. So I think more and more, the more we talk and the more we are able to, you know, give the information out and we're all open about things, how they work, then they have choices. You have choices and you can do this from residency. You can wait a few years and, you know, 
build up your financial side and pay some loans off. Um, you could do locums in Hawaii, you know, for three <laughs> years and pay everything off. Yeah. I mean, there's different options and different things you could do. But I think knowing that there is a choice and there is an option to practice different mm -hmm. yeah. is what's nice. Right. Well, thanks so much for this discussion. Cool. It was a Thank super you. interesting. Thanks I learned a lot about me. direct yes. primary care, which, I mean, I felt like I knew quite a bit. and I learned quite a bit today. So um, I'll actually be having another episode in a couple weeks on direct primary care as well. But it's going to be more on the specifics of, you know, if you want to actually do it, how really do you do it from step by step? Maybe a nuts and bolts. Yeah, <laughs> nuts it. and bolts. Uh, so hopefully it'd be real helpful for people if they're a resident or a current physician interested in kind of figuring out if that's something they could pull off. So, well, thanks again, Dr. Amat. Well, and thank you um, for the invitation. Maybe we'll talk again. Yeah, thanks. anytime. Thanks for listening to The Paradox. If you like what the doc is doing, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher and share the show with your friends. Become a supporting listener to get access to special bonuses at patreon.com forward slash the paradox. Show notes can be found at theparadox.com.